My best medicine has been to always, always pursue my passion relentlessly and without fear. When you pursue things that you are passionate about, it gives you purpose, it gives you meaning, and it gives you the motivation to continue to be your best. Hello, it's Dr. V. Welcome back to another episode of the podcast. And today, what an awesome guest. We've got the host of the doctors, Dr. Ian Smith, uh, with us today. He's going to be talking about um, how he grew up, how he became a TV doctor, how to lose weight in a pandemic, so much on mindset, heart set, and being able to serve the world. It's a great amount of content. You're going to love him. Dr. Ian Smith is the author of the number one New York Times bestselling books, Shred, The Revolutionary Diet, Super Shred, The Big Results Diet, Blast the Sugar Out, The Clean 20, The Ancient Nine, Clean and Lean, and 11 other books with millions of copies in print. His newest book, The Unspoken, is the first installment of his Ash Kane Mysteries series, and it is now available on Amazon. Dr. Smith graduated from Harvard College and received his master's degrees in science education from Teachers College of Columbia University. He attended Dartmouth Medical School and completed the last two years of his medical education and graduated from the University of Chicago Pritzker School of Medicine. He is great fun. You're going to love him, ladies and gentlemen. Dr. Ian Smith. Ian, thank you so much for your time. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm glad to be with you. Yeah, Dr. Ian, I, you know, I, I've been such a fan because he's really uh, taken health and, you know, used the power of media and entertainment to to share health in a very, very informative way, in a way that touches the emotional heartstrings of people. So I've been a fan for a long time. So thank you for saying yes. It's, hey, listen, it's my pleasure and. Um... You know, I appreciate anyone who says that they've watched my work and that they find something that's even remotely likable about it. So I'm always appreciative of that. Yeah, I, I love that the fact that you were so reachable. In fact, I think you responded to a DM from Instagram. Um, it was 3, 3 a.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time. And if you're out in Central Time, you're up early in the morning uh, responding and, and working on a new book, I think. Yeah, you know, I like to work... Um, really early in the morning, really late at night. I mean, I work during the day too, but those hours are very sacrosanct for me because everyone's sleeping uh, yeah. and it's quiet and I can really focus. And, you know, for me, because I do so many things, um, efficiency and focus are extremely important to me. And I think after all these years, I've kind of gotten a rhythm. So, yeah. you know, those hours, I am really productive. And, you know, when I'm in a, right now, I'm writing a book for 2023, actually. Um, no, wait, 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 wait. yeah, uh, yeah, 2022. <laughs> sorry. So I'm writing right now my book for my novel. I write two books a year. My novel for 2021 is done. This is the novel for 2022. And when I'm in a writing zone like that, yeah. um, um, I really am intensely engaged in the process. And so routine is very good for me. Um, having that safe space of time. Um, yeah. And lack of intrusion is also good. And then I take my breaks and I go on IG and I see what's going on. And I was doing an IG break and you hit me on the DM. So that's how we got together. Wow. Awesome. If you ever want to hit up Dr. Ian Smith, make sure you do it really, really <laughs> early in the morning. <laughs> so one of the things that I'd like to talk about initially, because, you know, we'll get into some health questions, but really want to know the story because what intrigued me most about you is you grew up from, you had a single mom, right? And you had a twin brother and growing up in that mindset. I was a boat refugee uh, born after the Vietnam War, came over on a boat, but we had very different mindsets. I, I grew up with this immigrant mentality that I was not rich enough, poor enough. I needed external validation a lot in, you know, pretty much a big chunk of my life. And it was chasing all these things, being stressed out that a couple of years ago, I was diabetic, I was overweight, I was hypertensive, and I got chronic disease from really just not being me. But when I heard, you know, I think you were on Ed Milet's podcast and you talked mm -hmm. about your story. You never really had that growing up. You know, I have this, this not enough feeling, but your mindset was, as long as you work hard, you're going to achieve good things. And, and I wonder where, where that got instilled. I, 
Well, I think, you know, first of all, I think that the way you felt and your journey is very common for uh, immigrants. I think yeah. that they find themselves constantly feeling like they're not part of and that they have to make all these changes. And I can only imagine I'm not an immigrant, but sometimes actually as a minority, it feels like I'm an immigrant. So I don't have that experience of feeling like I have to belong in that way or I need to change who I am. That being said, I think being, you know, being an African-American kid, yeah. um, um, I didn't come of any real financial means. Yeah. Um, however, my advantage, I will say, was that I had a family that was very loving, that was very generous yeah. in what we had, which was not a lot, but extremely generous as far as wisdoms and teaching me work ethic and giving me pointer constantly, even mm -hmm. when I didn't want them about how to be successful, how to succeed, how to carry myself with class and dignity, what are manners, what's etiquette, what's appropriate, what's inappropriate. And I think that for me, even since I was a little kid, like I don't remember my whole life it ever not being the case, I was always taught about excellence yeah. and that I was able to achieve excellence and that excellence, excellence was not dependent upon how much money we did have or didn't have or how small or big our house was or a car, didn't, that stuff didn't matter. What mattered was how I performed in school, how I performed in the field of athletic competition, how I treated other people, how I respected God in church. So I think that these really basic old time, old school values really yeah. formed who I was and it gave me the tools that I needed to be able to deal with, with which as you know, can be yeah. a very cruel and unfair world. No, I, I, I hear you on that. And I wonder what your thoughts now on this generation growing up. I mean, it took me getting chronic disease for me to wake up and say, oh, okay, I never really defined what success, happiness, and health was for me. And because I never did and was always chasing somebody else's life, my body just said, hey, you're not in alignment, brother. Yeah. So I wonder what you think about today because I, you know, I, I have uh, clients that, that I'm working on with weight loss, performance, longevity. They grow up in an environment of a lot of social media these days where you can start to really kind of compare yourself to a life that is uh, really constructed to, to make you look, you know, who knows if they're living that kind of life. What do you think the effects of social media are on, on the mental health of a lot of people today? Yeah, I think this is a very interesting time. I mean, right, all this stuff is new. I mean, social media in the form that it is now was new. And I think it's going to be very interesting to see what long-term impact it's going to have on the, on the generation that is most engaged with it. Of course, you and I are on social media, yeah. um, but our level of engagement is not the same level of engagement as a 20-year-old or an 18-year-old or 17-year-old. Yeah. So I think that it's going to be very interesting to see how that actually plays out. I mean, you know, with filters and people Photoshopping and creating, you know, images um, and optics that are completely illusionary. Uh, yeah. it's, it, you know, they're not real. And then that becoming who they are, you know, at least public facing, and now they got to try to live up to it. Right. Yeah. So, you know, you, you know, you sent your waistline down to a 30, mm -hmm. uh, if you're a guy and now when you go out in public, you feel like you got to be a 30. So what are you going to do to get there? So, and, and what if you're not a 30, um, you know, how do you address that? So I think that I think that social media is excellent in many ways and extremely dangerous in other ways. And I think that this generation is going to have to learn how to navigate the social media landscape so that it doesn't change who they are, the core of who they are. Yeah. Um, and it, it doesn't change uh, their feelings of being purposeful. Yeah. And meaningful and for themselves to have worth. Um, and so it, it's going to be tricky. I don't have the answer to it, but I think it, this is almost like an experiment. Yeah. It's going to be very interesting to see what the um, what the long term consequences will be. I, I completely agree with you. And I think it's so important. It is a tool. I mean, we, we're able to use social media just like we are you and I here to be able to talk about some higher level things and hopefully be able to instill a little bit of medicine and a little bit of hope that uh, that drowns out some of the other stuff that we see out there. This brings up another uh, great question is, you know, trying to identify what is safe, you know, people who are maybe overweight, obese and all that type of stuff and trying to look like people in social media, what is considered safe weight loss and, and 
safe, he healthy practices rather than, you know, trying to live up to some kind of ideal of how somebody should look, look like on TV or the media? Yeah, that's a really good question when you, and, and especially when you look at weight loss in terms of safety. Yeah. Um, you know, when I think of safe weight loss, the first thing I think about is the means by which someone is losing the weight. Yeah. That's, that's the first thing that matters to me. How is the person losing the weight? Are they doing it through exercise, by eating well, or are they doing it through extreme measures? Are they doing it through, you know, medical or surgical intervention? What are people doing to lose the weight? So that's the first, that's the first kind of uh, bucket that yeah. you have to address. Uh, and there are obviously unsafe ways and safe ways. Yeah. Then the question is, well, how much weight loss is considered to be safe? And I think that the second point is really predicated on the first point. You know, if someone's looking to, so average, you know, what we consider to be good weight loss, if a person can lose on average between a pound and a pound and a half a week, that is considered to be good weight loss. Mm -hmm. That often is not what people want. People want right. to lose five pounds a week. And so, you know, you have this huge misalignment yeah. between what is considered to be healthy and good and sustainable to what people want for whatever reason they want it. And it's this gap. It's this delta that we focus on when we talk about safety. What is safe? Mm -hmm. um, if someone is starving themselves and only consuming, you know, 600 calories a day, three or four days a week, that obviously is not very safe. Um, if someone is going to the gym and working out four hours a day, that also, by the way, is not safe. So, you know, I say to people, if you can lose a pound, a pound and a half, maybe two pounds on average a week, uh, some weeks you won't lose any, some you may lose a little more, but it's on average. Yeah. If you can uh, lose that weight and lose it in a way that you are able to sustain it, because mm -hmm. you're making behavioral and lifestyle changes that will allow you to do it. Someone who takes an injection and then eats only 600 calories, that's not, that weight loss may happen, yeah. but it's not sustainable because you're not always going to be injecting yourself and you're not always going to consume 600 calories a day. Yeah. So I really counsel people in my books. I talk about what is realistic. You know, you're yeah. going to have pizza, you're going to have cake, you're going to have yeah. pasta. And following a program that's going to exclude all of these fun foods for a prolonged period of time is not going to be a program you can stick to. Yep. Completely not sustainable at all. So I, I, I tell a lot of my clients, the 80, 20 rule, when it comes to that, it's like knowing all those things, but knowing, Hey, we're human. There's a lot of deliciousness that are out that that's out there. What would be your vice when it comes to food? What is your 20%? Yeah. You know, and I think that also how we frame it matters, right? You know, yeah. I stopped calling food a vice. Mm. Um, I stopped saying guilty pleasure. It's just mm. fun food. It's, you know, food is a full array of things and some things are healthier. Some things are tastier. It's, it's, you know, I don't right. like to vilify food, but for things that I eat that are not the healthiest of foods, I eat unhealthy food. Um, you know, I love sweet. I bake sweet potato pie, uh, which is my favorite pie of all time. Mm. Uh, I'm a big baker. I bake cakes. Um, I love ribs. I love barbecue ribs. I love barbecue, almost anything. Um, I just made last night barbecue salmon, you know, which is really simple. You know, salmon mm -hmm. is very healthy. Um, but I, you know, I said, look, put a little barbecue, barbecue yeah. sauce on it. <laughs> Give an extra little kick to it, you know. So, so yeah, I, I you know, I eat cookies. I, I really eat a lot of stuff. I eat French fries. I make burgers. What I don't eat, I don't eat, I don't drink any sodas. Um, I don't drink alcohol. Um, I don't, I'll eat French fries. I won't eat potato chips. I just think that potato chips... Um, even though they're both fried potato chips have so much junk in them. And yeah. I used to love barbecue potato chips. My goodness. Um, every once in a while I get like a, a feeling for them, but um, there's certain things I, I won't eat. Um, I'll eat hot dogs, but only on the golf course uh -huh. um, when I'm turning to the back nine. So, you know, <laughs> you know, I have my things like anybody else, but I try to eat healthy on balance 70% of the time. I try to eat, you know, cleaner, I try to eat lower in fat, lower in calories, but you know, I like a good ribeye like anybody else. Right. 
Well, I think that is so important to break that down because a lot of people feel like, you know, you've got this healthy diet and this completely unhealthy diet. And if you can't stick to the healthy thing, then you might as well stop trying. And that's when I know a lot of people stop trying. So you make it very realistic uh, for, for people to be able to attain those goals and live in the society we live in. Yeah. And, and one of the biggest compliments that I like about my, my plans is people say, this is realistic. Like this is doable. You know, there's pizza on this plan. There's a pancake on this plan. Yeah. You know, there's dairy. Yeah. There's cheese. Yeah. Because these, these are foods mm. we're going to eat. But let me show you how to either prepare or how to consume these foods mm. in a healthier way than you may have been doing it other, otherwise so that it could still be part of your diet. But also it's not going to be something that totally derails you uh, from your weight loss or your health journey. That's amazing. You know, uh, looking at you now, you're a writer, you're, you're a chef, <laughs> you've got it. You're, you're, you're kind of like this, this Renaissance person. And when I mentioned to some of the, my audience that I'll be having you on, we do have some trainees that are uh, listening and they know that you graduated from Harvard, from Dartmouth Medical School, from Chicago Pritzker School of Medicine. Was the idea to do TV, you know, in your heart the entire time or how you know did, did you want to be a clinician and how do you balance all, all these things and how would you suggest somebody who is starting out in their journey to be able to think about their career path if especially when they have so many interests yeah you know when i was i've always had multiple interests always my whole life as a little kid uh and i never believed and i'm glad i never believed that someone should allow themselves to be pigeonholed into just doing one thing oh you're smart in science and math. That means all you can do is engineering or research or being a doctor. I just right. didn't believe that because I was an athlete, a big time athlete. And so to me, I said, well, yeah, I played basketball really well and baseball and football, but also I'm great in math and science. I can do both. So when, when I would hear or see people try to say, okay, let's fractionate this here, this side, that side, left brain, right brain. No, no, no. I'm all brain. And my best advice to young people is do never allow others to limit your ability or desire to explore things that may, com may be completely unrelated. So I didn't want to be on television, but I always had an interest in mm. news and how the news was created. I was just very curious. Um, and I got an opportunity when I was in medical school to go to uh, NBC in Chicago and do an internship with one of the anchors. And I didn't, once again, I didn't do it because I was gonna go on TV. I yeah. did it because I figured before I graduate from med school and become you know, a lowly peasant-like intern in the hospital and get completely abused, where I would have no time whatsoever to do stuff I want. I said, let me take this advantage as a fourth year med student and go do an internship in a newsroom to learn about news. I think my career, when, you, when I look back at my career, I think my willingness to cut across the grain, yeah. my open-mindedness to try things that others think there's no way I should be doing it, I think that has been really the secret sauce to a career that I love, that I would never trade for anything else, and that I think makes me feel very fulfilled. That's amazing. It is great for people to hear that level of thinking, belief, and mindset because, uh, you know, certainly I, I, I know a lot of people with a lot of parents that have suggested that life should be a certain way. And, and it took me 40 years ago. Oh, you know what? I'm, I'm going to do a slight U-turn right now. So props to you and your family for, for giving you that mindset and upbringing growing up. Such an important point there. You've become, congratulations now. Uh, I saw a few episodes of The Doctors out this year. Uh, great work. What is it like being the host of The Doctors in this uh, era of the pandemic going on right now? Well, it's interesting because, you know, I think the show's been, this is the 13th season of the show. Yeah. It's uh, the first time they've ever had a solo host, which is yeah. me this year. Um, but I think that the show is more relevant now than ever, given what's going on in the world. And it's interesting over the summer when I did not have the gig, um, I was all, I was trying to be on social media, on Instagram, anywhere I could, radio stations, TV stations, trying to get the word out there, yeah. the real credible scientific information about what was going on. Because as we both know, unfortunately, politics led the conversation about 
something that was an infectious disease process rather than the doctors and the scientists. And so, you know, it really yeah. was the tail that was wagging the dog. And I would just say to myself, geez, every time I get a chance to get on a platform, I'm going to speak true to America and speak what I know. What I don't know, I don't know. But, right. you know, as I said to a lot of people, almost any third year medical student could tell you how to handle this pandemic because it's basic virology. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. this isn't what's complicated about this virus, obviously, yeah. is that it's new and we don't understand the intricacies of the virus, but we understand the basics of virus and how viruses are transmitted and how they can or cannot be treated and you know, how you need to uh, you know, wash and all these kinds of things that are basic for us as doctors wasn't being transmitted to the general public. Yeah. And so being the host of the doctors, I was really salivating when I got the call because I wanted to use that platform to give people the best information from the best resources so that people could try to lead their best lives. And that to me is very rewarding. I, I, I feel like the power of media and entertainment used to be able to to really kind of connect and, and tell the truth is so and so important. So having a brother like yourself um, out there representing not only minorities, but, but, but the truth in medicine and the truth in health. Um, by the way, you look great. You're how old are you now? 13? <laughs> yeah, right. 51 years old, man. Wow, brother. <laughs> Such a specimen. Th thank you for 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 being uh, the epitome of what health can look like, and for uh, for for sharing that for people. So, it's, well, it's interesting you say that because I don't know any other way, you know. So I don't want to accept that compliment fully because this is all I know. You know, it's like if someone grows up only speaking one language, and they go to another country, and that doesn't speak that language, and someone says, "Wow." Congratulations, you speak English so yeah. well, but that's all I know how to speak. So I don't know how not to be mindful of my body, how not to care about my body, uh, wanting to feel good, look good, live as long as I can. This is just kind of who I am. And um, it's a very interesting kind of mindset. I, I was thinking about this the other day. It's very interesting yeah. because I don't, I've never been on the other side of that to know what it feels like not to care, to feel mm. like you're lost or to feel like you don't have hope. Mm. Like I can only imagine that's very difficult. Um, yeah. Whereas for me, it's reflex. It's a reflex for me. This is, you know, I work out, I eat well, I don't overindulge. Like, you know, I'll eat ribs. I don't eat ribs every day. I don't eat fries every day. It's just, that's just not, I don't drink soda. It's just not who I am. So I say, thank you for the compliment, but also I am very empathetic yeah. To others who it's difficult. It's difficult for a lot of people. I, you remind me a lot of one of my um, one of my colleagues. He's a he's a radiologist and he's like super super fit, and that's just all he knows as well. So what would you say then if people aren't necessarily if it's not in your DNA, it's in his DNA too? For me, I actually had to work at it to get there. What would you say to those people who who don't have it in their DNA? How can those people start to maybe start to develop some of the mindset, the actions, the habits, and behaviors to emulate what you have naturally? This, Mind Over Weight. Ah. This book, look how small it is, by the way. See how small it is? <laughs> this book I wrote because I felt like people have heard for so long about nutrition and exercise. And they're, listen, I've written a lot of plans. There are tons of good plans out there that right. are not mine, tons of good plans. But I think what people have not heard enough of is what really happens above the neck, yeah. between the ears. That is really, to me, the starting point. Mm -hmm. And people want to start with the diet or the exercise plan or the gym or the trainer. When I believe you have to start in your mind first, if you can get your mind in the right place, and you can visualize and create a vision board and create landmarks and benchmarks. And if you can just really see your body and what you're doing and what you can do and where you're going, if yeah. you can do that, then the rest of it is just following, is executing a plan. It's executing yes. strategy, 
right? It's execution yeah. at that point. Yeah. But you have to have it here first. And I think that a lot of people, unfortunately, don't have it here. And what I try to talk about in Mind Over Weight, as I try to explain to people, this is how you find your motivation. This is how you keep your motivation. This is how you build a winning environment. Mm -hmm. This is how you fix your relationship to food. Um, these things... These things are important. And people, a lot of people, before they read the book, don't realize kind of how misaligned they are in a lot of things. They don't because they didn't, they never really thought about it, right? Yeah. Uh, and so anyway, I think that I think that it's in the mind first and then the body follows. That is a very crucial point. I, I recognize that as I went from being overweight to like losing everything, is if you don't fix it in the mind, it's almost kind of like doing the actions. While you know driving with the brakes on, if you right. would you agree with that? Yes, yes, wonderful. It's a wonderful analogy. It is, it is absolutely that. And but once you take those brakes off, uh, and I've done it before. You know, I've I had my emergency brake on and kept saying, "Yes, like something's not right. Like it's moving, but it doesn't feel right." And you're like, mm -hmm. "Oh my goodness, the emergency brake is on." You take that off, and boom, you know, you're off to the races. And I think that's the same thing. You can still lose weight, by the way away and find some success yeah even if your mind is not exactly in the right place mm -hmm. but man if you get that mental alignment the sky's the limit right 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 you you just feel like it's a freedom when you when you finally taste it it's a freedom that and, and an ease uh to a lot of your actions so i completely agree with that so let me ask you right now how is your mental state how are your emotional states how are you dealing with everything that's going on with the with the virus now how are you staying healthy and, and keeping yourself strong and you know have you had you know have, have you dealt with you know losing friends and family members to the virus i know i have well, I have to tell you, be honest with you, that my situation, I admittedly have to say, is unique. Uh, I know there are a lot of people who are who have lost loved ones, who are frustrated, who have been sick or know someone who's been very sick. For me, my life before COVID was very, very busy in the sense of I travel a lot for book tours, yeah. for TV gigs. All these things put me on the road a lot. So this was a great opportunity for me to stay home for all these months. I've not been home this much in 15 years mm. consecutively to be able to stay home and be able to sleep in my bed every night and eat at my table every night with my family and to be able to work. I have been the most prolific during this period because it's allowed me to just focus on the work, to get up in the morning, to work mm -hmm. out, get to the computer and work. I've written two books during COVID. I'm halfway done with the third one because people say, well, how do you do that? Because listen, we're home. Everyone's home. I mean, I'm home like everybody else. And so I go to the grocery store, I get gas in the car, but by and large, I'm home working out, working, doing Zoom calls or watching Netflix, right? And so COVID, while it has been disastrous for the world, and I agree with that, and I don't want to minimize mm. how deleterious it's been for so many people. That being said, for me personally, it's been extremely rewarding yeah. because it's allowed me to reconnect to my, with myself, with my loved ones, with my friends, and it's allowed me to be very proficient uh, and efficient at getting a lot of work done. That is such an amazing point, and I want the audience to be able to hear this because you took a situation that is potentially, you know, could be construed in, in very bad terms, in terms of its circumstances, but you don't rest a lot of your mind on that and, and look to where you could be more productive with your life of where, where, where life has guided you because this virus has come in. You know, when, when COVID first hit, my girlfriend I was dating at the time, she became pregnant. We moved in together in, in my house. My bank accounts were doing this. I wasn't, I wasn't seeing private clients. And I thought, this is, this is terrible. I, I wanted to open up a, a clinic in Beverly Hills in, in the middle of doing so. But this really forced us to be together. Mm. And there was never a time in my life where I was able to be fully vulnerable with how I, you know, of my fears of, of mm. what I thought about life and mm. be in front of somebody deeply working on a relationship. I always ran the first ch chance I got when, when the relationship went bad. Mm -hmm. And we really, really developed that bond and connection with each other. And now, you know, now she's my fiance. We're expecting a, a daughter in a month. You know, my grandmother would always say to us, 
you know, find the silver lining yeah. in the cloud, in every cloud. And I think I've told people to begin the pandemic on my Instagram page right from the beginning. And I'm so glad I did this. I said to people, listen, there are things about this pandemic that are going to be completely out of your control. Yeah. And you can't spend an inordinate amount of time worried about things in life that you can't control. There are, however, things in your life that you will still be able to control. So focus your energies and your efforts on the things that you can actually change. And yeah. that is what makes people productive. And so, you know, it's been a bad situation for everybody. And we talk about deaths, but we don't often talk about the loss of life experience, graduations, weddings, no. funerals, uh, kids going to school the first time in high school, first time as a freshman in college, all the seniors not being able to have a class picture together. I mean, think about state championships that yeah. athletes can't go for. So there's been so much loss for so many people in so many different ways, but I still believe you have to stay positive and say, this is my mindset. This is going to come to an end. And when this comes to an end, this is what I want to show for it. I want to show myself physically. I want to show the books that I've written. Yeah. I want to show the people I've helped, the ideas I've created. So I think that it's a time for people to be trying to be productive. That's an amazing thing. And I think many, many people are starting to get that, you know, everything in life, uh, you know, I think Byron Katie has a quote. He, she says, life is simple. Um, life is always happening for you and not to you. And uh, you don't necessarily have to see it that way. But if you do, it, life just becomes a lot easier. 100%. 100%. I agree with you. Yeah. Amazing. And I know you've got a book called The Unspoken yeah. uh, out. Uh, you know, you read a lot of diet books too, but this is, this is a fiction. Yeah. So The Unspoken is my third novel. I've always wanted to be a novelist. This one in particular is a new series I've created um, and people can get it on amazon.com. And it's about basically a guy who was a former detective with the Chicago police department who leaves because he doesn't want to participate in the cover up of a bad shooting. Mm. And he becomes a private investigator and he takes on, and he's also a golf fanatic uh, and like me, and he takes on very select cases in and around the city of Chicago. So it's a really fun series uh, it already has got an option to become a TV series. So fingers crossed mm. that um, we go to market with it in the next couple of weeks. But it's fun. Um, and I think people will enjoy it. It's great escapism. You know, reading mm. fiction and novels um, and mysteries, it's just fun to escape. You know, you talk about the stress, our everyday stressors. Yeah. To be able to snuggle up with a good book, I think, even now, I know it's old fashioned, but to snuggle up with a good book, even if it's digital, it just takes your mind into a whole nother world. And I think it really is it's fun and it's exciting. And so I hope people will get a chance to read The Unspoken um, and just go on this journey with me. It's a, it's a fun ride. Oh, amazing. And did you say it was already released? Yeah, it's released. It's on Amazon. Um, book two, actually, of the series comes out next October. But this just came out October 1st. And from what I'm hearing from people, they really are enjoying it. It's a lot of twists and a lot of turns. So you got to, like I say, you got to strap your seatbelt on because you're going for a ride. Oh, nice. All right. I've got one last question for you. But before we get to that last question, what do people know more about you? You're on the doctors, but you've got your own social platforms as well. Sure. So on, on uh, Instagram, it's at Dr. Ian Smith, spell the doctor out, I-A-N Smith. On Twitter, it's D-R Ian Smith. And my website is DrIansmith.com. Once again, spell the doctor out. Amazing. So here's the last question for you. You lived an amazing life, but what has been your best medicine? My best medicine has been to always, always pursue my passion relentlessly and without fear. When you pursue things that you are passionate about, it gives you purpose, it gives you meaning, and it gives you the motivation to continue to be your best. That was amazing. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Ian Smith, host of The Doctors, author of the new book, The Unspoken. Check him out. Ian, thank you for your time. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you for joining me on this episode. If you received value, I truly, truly appreciate it. If you could leave a five-star review, it will help the show grow. 
and I'd love to connect with you. You can follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at KianVuMD. If you haven't already, pick up a copy of my book, Thrive State, at thrivestatebook.com. And remember, you are your best medicine. Thank you.